second. Standing by for the first launch of humans from Space Launch Complex 40. of Max Q. Vehicle is supersonic. And the Falcon 9 is now traveling faster than the speed of sound. Stage one total. Stage one Bravo. Copy one Bravo. That call out for one Bravo means we're in the second and final board mode for the first stage and continuing to get good performance. And that chill is underway. Crew is pulling just over two Gs at this point. Next up, we heard the engine chill on the second stage impact engine has begun, and then we will have Nico, or main engine cut off, where the nine engines on the first stage will cut off ahead of the first and the second stages, and then will separate from one another. Then that single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage will ignite and continue to carry crew nine to orbit while the first stage begins its journey back to Earth. Two minutes in, and the crew is now traveling over 2,600 miles per hour. Stage one is throttling down. Confirmation there from Mission Control that stage one is throttling down as we prepare for main engine cutoff, followed shortly thereafter by stage separation and second engine start one. You did hear Mission Control out that we are chilling our... Miko. There's confirmation of Miko. Stage separation confirmed. Alpha. And back ignition. Copy, two Alpha. With that, we have had confirmation of Miko, stage sep, and the ignition of our MVAC engine on board stage two. Our next major milestone is going to be the beginning of stage one boost pack burn, which is expected in just a couple of seconds here. Of course, if you are just joining us, you've got views of our first stage on the left-hand side of your screen and of MVAC burning with our Crew-9 astronauts aboard up in space on the right-hand side of your screen. Now we are coming up on 3 minutes and 20 seconds since liftoff today, traveling over 4,000 miles per hour and 76 miles downrange. As our first stage makes its way back to Earth, we are tracking a landing attempt today at Landing Zone 1, not too far from where we lifted off in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Confirmation there that both vehicles are on nominal trajectories. Everything looking good. Everything is looking good. And we're getting good performance on that single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage. The crew's G-load dips right now. We are going to prepare to hit the separation event. Right now, they're about 1G, which is about what we're used to experiencing on Earth. The crew's traveling almost 5,000 miles per hour now and 105 miles in altitude.
As we await the entry burn for our first stage, you are getting great views of it on the left-hand side of your screen. You can also see two of our titanium grid fins, which are the primary mechanical structures. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Confirmation there for mission control that everything is still looking good. Freedom copies, nominal trajectory. Now, as I mentioned, those grid fins are the primary mechanical structures that we use to steer the booster back toward its landing zone, which today is LZ-1 at Cape Canaveral. Just as kind of a quick point of reference, those grid fins are about four by five feet, so roughly the size of a coffee table. Getting our first tracking shots of the booster on its way back to Earth. Again, we are tracking the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen and MVAC up in space on the right. And we do continue to hear good calls for that second stage. Again, we, it, we will see this continue to fire in close, until close to nine minutes into the flight, now at five minutes and 45 seconds since liftoff today. This is accelerating Dragon to more than 17,000. nominal trajectory. More good news. Freedom copy, nominal trajectory. This second stage is bringing Dragon to more than 17,000 miles per hour. That puts our crew in orbit. And the single Merlin vacuum engine can produce over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space. Stage one does perform three burns on its way back to Earth. The first is the boost back burn, followed shortly thereafter by the entry burn. The entry burn is used by Falcon 9 to slow the vehicle down before it reaches the denser parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Nominal trajectory is there for mission control. Freedom copies, nominal trajectory. That entry burn is, of course, followed by the landing burn during which time we'll light three of, the MBA, or three of the Merlin engines on board the first stage. And we expect to see that landing burn just about a minute before we expect Dragon to be inserted into orbit. So we have two very exciting phases of flight, both for our first stage and our Crew-9 astronauts happening here at the same time. So a great touchdown of stage one there just a second ago. And now, of course, we are continuing to follow our Crew-9 astronauts on their way to space. And we continue to get good calls for this second stage, that Merlin vacuum engine continuing to fire and propel our crew, now moving over 12,600 miles per hour and 611 miles downrange. Just over eight minutes since liftoff today, so we are expecting to see this continue to fire until just about the nine minute mark, at which point this engine will cut off. And of course, Dragon will coast for a few minutes, still attached Terminal to the guide. second stage. Shannon. That call is for Shannon, Ireland. That would be the uh, board zone if we were to abort at this point in the flight. However, we are continuing to hear good calls about Dragon's performance. And back shut down. Confirmation of the Merlin vacuum engine shutting down. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal orbit insertion. Good news there from mission. From mission control and our crew that we have had nominal Dragon orbit insertion. Launch escape system disarmed. Freedom copies. LBS disarmed. In nine quick minutes, uh, we now have two new crew members on their way to the International Space Station, having taken off from Space, space Launch Complex 40. 
The crew now being in a good or expected orbit. We'll continue to coast for these few minutes. Uh, now we get our first views inside the capsule of our two crew members, Nick Haig and Alexander Gorbanov. They are just continuing to stay in their suits and in their seats during this dynamic portion of the flight. We're going to continue to coast for a few minutes after this second stage engine cutoff. These, this allows the rates and motion from that long burn to settle out. There are some small reaction thrusters on the upper stage of, or the upper part of the second stage that can be used to counteract any residual motion. That basically makes sure we're in a stable coast before where Dragon separates from Falcon, and that'll happen about 12 minutes into the flight. So about a minute and a half from now, we expect to see Dragon actually separating from the second stage. Again, we did hear the crew has been successfully inserted into a good orbit. And again, this is them now in microgravity, one of them, Alexander Gorbanov, for the very first time. So as Leah mentioned, we are now just a few minutes away from the separation of Dragon from stage two, during which time a number of activation checkouts occur. Automatically, first we're going to be checking out 12 of the Draco maneuvering thrusters all around the service section of the Dragon spacecraft. We're also, of course, going to get ready for that nose cone opening, which will allow Dragon to dock with the International Space Station about 28 hours from now. The nose cone stays closed for the flight uphill to help protect again all of the guidance, navigation, and control sensors and Dragon's docking adapter. It's also covering four of our Draco thrusters that will be used for the majority of different phasing burns required as Dragon chases down the space station. We are currently standing by for that separation, which could happen any time in the next couple of minutes. Currently, you can see the crew is uh, just relaxing in their seats. They are definitely vigilant, though. They are able to monitor those crew displays in front of them, keep up with what's going on in the mission. Uh, they could take control if they needed to. However, it's been a seamless ride to space today. Good news, they were looking up into Dragon's trunk, looking at the heat shield on the bottom of Dragon that Crew 9 will use when it returns home early next year. There you heard from Mission Control. Both Dragon, Chief Engineer on Countdown 1. Nick, Alex, on behalf of the entire team, we thank you for flying with Falcon 9 today and wish you a great mission. And Frida, this is Launch Director on Countdown. On behalf of the entire SpaceX Launch and Recovery Team, I'd like to extend our congratulations to the entire Crew 9 team. Zena, Stephanie, Nick, Alex, Butch, and Sonny. It is an honor to be a part of this mission with all of you. I would also like to give a shout out to the Falcon 9 Crew 9 combo. The best bundle in the league, baby. Godspeed, Crew 9. Uh, couldn't say it any better. Thank you, guys. You know, we had the opportunity to meet so many people that were involved with uh, the Falcon 9, and uh, along the way, it was a sweet ride. I'm pretty sure my youngest son would say it was Sigma. Alex has got a few words to add as well. And how do we think the planet wants to talk to us? The last part of us wants to be protected. And some people are telling me that they have to talk. And also, I'd like to express my gratitude to the hundreds of thousands of people around the world for the work in the development of space technology and the community of the world. The best part is also the best accomplishment. from our commander and great views of Dragon up in orbit on your screen right now. It's been about 14 minutes and 30 seconds since Coming up on 
15 minutes now since liftoff today. You got a quick look inside the capsule. Dragon SpaceX, we had a nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. No scope to deploy is in progress. And freedom copies all. Thank you. Confirmation there that our nose cone deploy is underway. That means that the six hooks that hold the nose cone in, plate dur in place during launch and the ascent portions of flight have begun to retract. That will allow the nose cone to start to swing open and deploy. That will uncover a, num a number of critical systems for the flight up station, including the forward bulkhead thrusters and the docking hatch. Incredible views from our crew up in space on your screen right now, but I'm sure it's nothing compared to the view out of Dragon's window as they make their way to the space station. I can only imagine. And that journey to the space station will take about 28 hours, so they won't arrive until tomorrow afternoon. In the meantime, they will have the opportunity to get out of their suits, uh, to get out of their seats as well, and, and kind of just enjoy the ride. They're gonna shift into some off-duty time that allows them to, um, to you know, prepare any food that they would want to. That allows them to um, maybe even call down to the ground. Um, they will also obviously get some sleep before a really big day tomorrow, monitoring the arrival and docking to the International Space Station. Of course, we're going to cover all of that live. I'm really looking forward to seeing two more crew members float into the orbiting laboratory. And if you're just joining us, we did lift off now at 16 minutes and 29 seconds ago. Uh, that was right on time at 1.17 p.m. Eastern time from Space Launch Complex 40 down at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. We have two members on board Dragon today. That's NASA astronaut Nick Haig, who's serving as the commander, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov, who's making his very first flight to space. Once they arrive at the International Space Station tomorrow afternoon, they will be joining nine other crew members on orbit. They'll be up there for about a week. A week is, is probably the best guess um, until the Crew 8 team, uh, it's time for that crew to come home. Of course, they launched about seven months ago at this point. Uh, and, um, they will undock after they have completed a handover period with the Crew-9 crew, bringing them up to speed on everything that they've been working on for the last seven months in orbit. So once they depart, we'll be back down to our typical approximately seven uh, people living and working aboard the International Space Station. We are getting really spectacular views from up in space today. Shot there of our MVAC engine. We did get confirmation several minutes ago of SES-1. And we know that nose cone opening is underway as well. Those are uh, a series of hooks and latches that allow the nose cone to open. And uh, that nose cone is closed during launch to protect the docking hatch, to protect four uh, bulkhead thrusters that we will use for some of the larger burns that help us get to the International Space Station. One of the other things we're doing right now is going ahead and opening the ECLIS system, which stands for the Environmental Control and Life Support System, which will be activated inside of Dragon. As Leah mentioned earlier, soon our crew will be able to get their visors open and get out of their spacesuits and settle in for that 20 hour ride, 28 hour ride to the International Space Station. Good views there of the opening of Dragon's nose cone on the left-hand side of your screen. Coming up on 19 minutes since liftoff today, the crew, again, had a good orbital insertion, uh, and that actually puts 14 people currently in low Earth orbit. That includes the uh, those living on the International Space Station right now, as well as those living on the Chinese Space Station. So a total of 14 humans are now not off the planet, but rather orbiting around it. More good views from our dragon nose cone on the left-hand side of your screen as it very gradually swings open. Obviously in space, everything we do has an equal and opposite reaction. So slow and steady really wins the race here.
Again, now 20 minutes since liftoff today. Dragon is flying free from the second stage. And it looks like they're about to enter an orbital nighttime. So now that they're at orbital velocity, that 17,500 miles per hour, uh, they are going to see 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. Again, it was an on-time liftoff at 1.17 p.m. Eastern time from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida and a clean ride uphill. We've had some good communication from Mission Control up to our Crew 9 astronauts already today. One of the things you may heard every one of the things you may hear every time we communicate with the crew is a slight beep beforehand. That's called a Quindar tone, and actually dates all the way back to the early days of human spaceflight, and is effectively a radio signal indicating that we're communicating between the between the crew in orbit and our mission control team on the ground. We now have views back inside the capsule. Dragon 36, we had a nominal nose cone opening. Um, we do have just about three minutes here left in the ground station pass. If you've got any fluffy stowaways you'd like to introduce. And yeah, Freedom Copy is a uh, good trick for check out, good nose cone opening. And uh, I just, just so happen to have a uh, furry friend with me. Freedom, so yeah, I've got a, uh, a little Falcon here. I love the uh, the package of Falcon 9, Crew 9. Yeah, we've got a Falcon on board with us. Uh, this one's a multi flyer, though. Uh, was on uh, my first flight with Alexei and I, and uh, with Alexei and I and Christina, and now me and Alex. So say hello to Aurora. We see your dragon. Uh, actually, a good view right now because we're looking at the display cam. And dragon delayed call, but nominal TCS reconfiguration as well as Ford Bulkhead Draco checkouts. And Freedom Copies, good TCS, good uh, Draco checkouts. Spectacular views of our Crew-9 uh, astronauts and zero-G indicator up in orbit. Human spaceflight has come so far in the last five years with Dragon. Since Demo-2 in May of 2020, SpaceX's Dragon fleet has launched a total of 54 crew members to space, 34 on behalf of NASA and their partners, and 20 commercial astronauts, including the first two all-civilian missions to space and the first three all-private passenger missions to the International Space Station. In addition to flying people, <clears throat> excuse me, SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft also enables researchers the opportunity to fly critical science to orbit. And that's just like what we saw with the three investigations that NASA's Human Research Program flew on Polaris Dawn. So far, SpaceX and Dragon have carried over 1,000 research experiments to and from low Earth orbit, both to the International Space Station and on our free flyer missions as well. From DNA sequencing to 3D printing, studies enabled by Dragon and the International Space Station and, and the International Space Station test a variety of technologies, systems, and materials that will be needed for future long-duration exploration missions. Every mission yields critical research and learning that help make life both on Earth and in space better. And flights like today's help us continue to lay this foundation for our future among the stars and continue our mission to make life multiplanetary. But for now, we'll be signing off from SpaceX, and we're going to send you back over to NASA. But before we go, we do want to thank NASA for entrusting us with today's mission. And of course, thank you to all of the viewers for being here with us today.
Yeah, it was a really special mission. It was fantastic to see uh, now two new crew members in orbit and on the way to the International Space Station. So with that, we're going to end our coverage from Hawthorne until we pick back up with our docking coverage in about 26 hours. So for now, we're going to send it back to you, Zena and Daryl, at Kennedy Space Center to wrap up today's launch coverage. Thank you very much, Leah and Atticus, and welcome back here to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We're just about 25 minutes ago. We watched Crew 9 lift off from Space Launch Complex 40 for the first time with humans at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. NASA astronaut Nick Haig and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov are now en route to the International Space Station. I'm Daryl Dale, and this is NASA astronaut Zena Cardman, who has been with us for the past four hours documenting Crew 9's path from astronaut crew quarters suiting up all the way to the rocket lifting off and then getting into space today. And I got to watch it with Xena in this role I get to watch oftentimes as, as we break, go outside and watch a uh, launch with the astronaut. And uh, in this particular case, Xena, with you being the commander from the beginning and then giving up your seat, you and fellow astronaut uh, Stephanie Wilson, so that those seats could be used by Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams to come back. Um, this has a very close association to you, clearly. Um, what was your reaction there when you were watching them lift off into space? Yeah, Daryl, I think every crude launch that I have ever watched has really brought me a lot of emotion. This one today was especially unique. I think it was hard not to watch that rocket lift off without thinking, that's my rocket and that's my crew. But I also know that I'm not the only person who can think that. Of course, we have Stephanie Wilson here today, but I mean there are many, many people who made this mission happen, and there are people on orbit who will be taking this capsule home. And it makes me very proud to know that I am one of many people who can say, that's my crew, that's my rocket. Makes me really proud, makes me feel very connected to this mission that we all get to take part of. Go Crew 9. <laughs> Well said, Zena. And an emotional moment in time out there uh, watching the rocket uh, lift off. And, and now the work begins. You will start training for the next mission. You spent a year and a half training for this one. You're now going to go into space at some point. What does the future hold for you at this point? Yeah, it's a little bit to be determined. We've got a lot of exciting things ahead. I'm looking forward to starting training again at some point. And in the meantime, I can't wait to watch Nick and Alexander and the entire Expedition 72 crew really get to work and execute that mission that we all have worked so hard to make possible. Yeah, Nick and Alexander will become part of Expedition 72, as you mentioned, when they arrive on Space Station. NASA's Megan Cruz has joined us now with Jennifer Buckley, the chief scientist for the ISS program, with more about the science that's happening on board for Expedition 72. Megan. Yeah, it's great to have Jen here. And, and Jen, you know, obviously we saw some changes through the mission, um, most uh, uh, notably the change from a four to a two-person crew. Did any changes affect the science? Well, the human research is specific to the crew member, um, so Bush and Sunny have their science complement that will stay with them. But other than that, we didn't have to adjust our science plans. Uh, Bush and Sunny are experienced crew members, so they um, jumped right in and have been helping us already with science on board, and we were able to keep our um, plan complement. Oh, that's fantastic. And I know Expedition 72, they're going to be responsible for making a repair on the NICER instrument on the space station. Can you tell us about that instrument and significance? That's right. So NICER is an X-ray telescope that's mounted outside of the International Space Station, and it takes a look at neutron stars. Um, neutron stars are the born from the cinders of a supernova event. Um, they are the leftover um, material that then form neutron stars, and uh, they're going to be repairing um, a light leak that occurred in May of 2023, which mm -hmm. um, gave us some degraded uh, detectors on that instrument. Okay, gotcha. And so that's what we're um, uh, fixing so that hopefully it works at tip-top shape? <laughs> that's right. So right now with the um, damage, we um, still get full data during um, darkness. Mm -hmm. However, during sunlight, it degrades the data that we're able to get. And so uh, when they do that repair in December, um, we'll bring NICER back up to its full capability. Oh, perfect. Okay, well, obviously, we as NASA look out into the universe, but also we look back at our own Earth. And, and uh, for those who don't know, uh, one way that we do that and look at our Earth is we have our astronauts take photos from the International Space Station. And I was told that more photos were taken from the ISS of Earth in uh, the last six months than all of 2023. That's right. So in the first six months of 2023, 2024, they took over 300 and
130,000 photographs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so, you know, this photography, apart from being absolutely beautiful, is really important um, for the science imagery. As you mentioned before, this allows us to take a look at our planet um, and we can see how it's changing over time as well as any environmental impacts. We also support the disaster response network. Um, so we're able to look at national uh, natural disasters like uh, wildfires or even hurricanes. So we were involved in um, taking some imagery of Hurricane Helene as well. Um, and we um, support um, other government agencies and, and provide that data. Yeah, it's always so important to talk about, yes, the work that we do as we look out into the universe, but also as we reflect here on Earth and see what we can do to improve things for everyone. So Jen, thank you so much. Thanks for detailing the science for us. We'll send it back to our folks there. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Megan, and uh, good to be back with you here with NASA astronaut uh, Zena Cardman. We are wrapping up our coverage uh, for today after a successful launch of Crew 9. But before we do, I want to know if you take one more social question. Absolutely. Fantastic. Let's put it up uh, for us. This is, uh, let's see, Maya, age 10, asks, I want to know, because I want to work there, <laughs> How is it to work at NASA? I want to be an aerospace engineer when I grow up. That is awesome. Maya, we can't wait to have you in the NASA family. It's an amazing place to work. I love working in spaceflight, human spaceflight especially, and there are so many different types of people with different backgrounds who work. I love that we can all come together for this common goal coming from such different backgrounds. So all you've got to do is apply, and we'll see you soon. As a young girl yourself, you probably never imagined that you would be here. I sure did not. And you made it happen as well. That's right. Myself, but most especially all of the mentors and family and friends who made me who I am. Takes a team. Well said. Well said, Zena. Now, uh, as we wrap things up, we want to let you know that though our coverage is coming to a close, you can still follow along with Crew 9's entire journey to the station by listening to the Mission Real-Time Audio Commentary. Just to do that, you can snap that QR code that you see on the screen there, or if you're watching us on your phone, just screen grab it and you can click on it later. Nick and Alexander are on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Sunday, September 29th. On-camera coverage of docking and arrival will resume about two hours before uh, that happens on NASA+. Plus. And, of course, that's always a big moment when the crew arrives, you know, especially not just for the people who are going there, that's their destination, but for the people who get to see them as well. Absolutely. It's a really joyful moment. I love few things more than I love watching astronauts fresh through that hatch, hugging each other and welcoming their new crewmates. It's an amazing thing to see. And there's three of them, if you count uh, this little guy right here, which you brought on board. That's this, right. This was the uh, zero-G indicator. That's exactly right, and I absolutely love the history that this zero-G indicator has for Nick Haig specifically, and I'm sure Alexei Ovchinin will be happy to be reunited with that zero-G <laughs> indicator as well. So getting the band back together. Seems like it's a good luck charm at this point. It seems that way. All right. Well, Zena, I want to thank you for co-hosting with me today. Yeah, I know it was a challenge, uh, it was emotional at times, but thank you for sharing your insight, your experiences, your knowledge, but most of all, your heart. Appreciate you. Thank you, Daryl. Go Crew 9. Go Crew 9. All right, with that, we're going to wrap it up and uh, wish you a great day. An important reminder, though, about an upcoming launch in a few weeks here at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida on October 10th at 1231 p.m. Europa Clipper is scheduled to lift off aboard a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket on its five-and-a-half-year journey to Jupiter's moon Europa. You can watch it live uh, right here on NASA Plus starting at 1130 a.m. Again, huge thanks to all of our guests, for everyone who joined us today. But most importantly, we appreciate you for being here and watching. You can keep up with any Crew 9 updates to the mission using the online resources you see on your screen now. For everyone here at NASA and SpaceX, have a great rest of the day. We look forward to seeing you again soon. But we leave you now with a moment looking back at the highlights from suit up to liftoff.